Make some noise if you're excited to be in the house of God today. Come on. Yeah, that's good. That's, we're getting better. 80% of you are excited to be in church. We're going to work on the other 20% of you. I mean, we wouldn't be like the church that God has called us to be if 20% of you didn't really want to be here. I'm glad you're here anyway, okay? However you got here, I'm stoked, man, because I believe God wants to speak to you. And we're in this series called Legacy. We're actually in this season, really a season of rebuilding. That's why we're doing this series, because the enemy has done a lot of damage, destruction um, that there has been in our families, in our faith, maybe in some of those disciplines that were healthy for us. This, this last year and a half has been so crazy for so many people, maybe not uh, for everybody, for a lot of us, it's just knocked us off our rhythms. And not just that, like there's been some damage as we look back where we are now and what this last year and a half or two years has done to us, our walk of faith, our family, our kids, our marriages, there's been some damage. And so we're looking at, at this series, Legacy, and studying the book of Nehemiah, because Nehemiah rebuilt the walls of Jerusalem in 52 days where other people could not do it for years. For years they couldn't do it. Nehemiah comes on the scene with the help of God. I'm getting attacked. With the help of, huh, I rebuke you. <laughs> with the help of God. Um, and he rebuilds the wall in in. 52 days, and here's what I'm believing is like in this, like we're in week four. So over the course of 52 days, I've been praying for you, and we've been praying together. I'm praying for a breakthrough in your life and breakthrough in your marriage and family specifically um, where the enemy has tried to steal and rob or redirect or damage in those areas. I'm just believing that God will bring some restoration and rebuilding as we fully devote ourselves back to the commitments and the kingdom of God for God to do a really amazing and powerful work. Can I get an amen? Come on. Amen, amen. All right, we're in week number four here. And I thought about going, I honestly... I wanted to go to Nehemiah chapter 6, and, and I'm going to give you one verse in Nehemiah chapter 6 today. But I actually need to study with you Nehemiah chapter 5. And if you do have some sermon notes uh, today, grab them, grab your, grab your pen. If you're looking at them, I went crazy on the notes today. I did. <laughs> I, I, I gave you guys way too much information to get your pens ready. Nehemiah chapter 6 verse 1, and let me kind of tell you where... We're going today. Nehemiah 6, verse 1. This is the only verse we'll share in Nehemiah 6, and then we'll go backwards. Sambalat, Tobiah, Geshem, the Arab, and the rest of our enemies found out that I had finished rebuilding the wall and that no gaps remain. Today, the title of the message is Close the Gaps. Say, Close the Gaps. See, there are gaps in your legacy. There are gaps in your rebuilding. And I really wanted to rush into, like, how do you rebuild? And how do you finish strong? And how do you complete the wall? And the determination to do it. And that's where I wanted to go today. But I felt the Holy Spirit telling me, no, nope, there are still some gaps that you need to address. There are some gaps in, in the wall. There are some gaps in our legacy. And, and here's the, our working definition of a gap today. A gap is this. A gap is the space between where you are and where you need to be. It's that space like, like where, where you currently are, where your marriage is, your faith is, your walk is, and where you know, man, you want to be. You, where you want to be, your own desire, your own intention, your, your, you, you should be even. You're like, that's where I could be. Like, it's just the, the gap. There's a gap. What the enemy has done, what you have done, whatever it is, there's just a gap that exists in our rebuilding process here. And, and I went gap crazy today. Yeah. I went gap crazy. If you're looking at your notes, I got like nine gaps. I want to, you know what I mean? What am I doing? Hold on. So here's, I just, I really felt inspired. Like there are some gaps that need to be closed. And I think that some of these gaps or one or more of these gaps that you need to address, if you truly want to rebuild and be who God has called you to be, you got to address the gaps, and I think there's there's nine in the in the story of Nehemiah. There's nine maybe in our life. Yeah, I went a little gap crazy, but but there's one in particular. Uh, the ninth one is actually what I want to study in detail. <laughs> so so we're gonna go through we're gonna go through these, but I need your engagement today because I'm it's just gap crazy, and so you guys are just gonna be like. So here's what we're gonna do. I I, I want some talk back at each one. I'm just gonna ask you to say close the gaps. So say it, close the gaps. 
Okay, that's what we need to do today. We're going to close the gaps. I hope some of these are, are maybe what you're experiencing or what needs to be closed for you to see God do what he wants to do in your life, marriage, in your family. Here's the first one. The first gap out of nine of them today is the assumption gap. The assumption gap says this, that I assume it'll automatically happen. Like this is just going to get better by itself. Like as long as I love my wife, our marriage will be fine. I mean, that's right, right? As long as I have love for, as long as, as long as that happens, or as long as like I go to church, I'll fulfill my destiny. You know, it'll just happen automatically. Please listen, you do not fulfill your legacy automatically or accidentally. Your legacy is fulfilled intentionally. So there's a gap here in what you're assuming will happen. Like, like you just assume it'll happen automatically. Nehemiah didn't assume the wall would build automatically. He took responsibility. We need heard the report of the wall. He didn't say, Some, God, send somebody else, use somebody else. He said, here I am, God, use me. It ain't gonna, if, you're gonna, if it's going to happen, you got to use somebody. Might as well be me. Use me, God. Okay, so you gotta ask, you gotta close the gap of of assumption that it'll happen automatically. Say close the gap. Close the gap. All right, you guys are come on now. Number two, here's the second gap. That's the knowledge gap. The knowledge gap. Uh, this one gets on my nerves. Come on, as a dad, as a parent, I don't know how. I don't know how to do that. Any parents in the room where you're trying to teach your kids how to do the dishes, take out the trash, or something like make their bed. The the I don't know how to do that. Are you kidding me? It's a trash can liner. You don't know how to tuck it in so that it doesn't get trapped in there. Kid, come on, kid. Like, I don't know how. Okay. Okay. Like, like Nehemiah could have could have been like, I don't know how to build a wall, right? He's a cupbearer, not a contractor. God, I don't know how, but I believe Nehemiah had to close this knowledge gap because for him to do what God called him to do, he would have to learn what he didn't know. And so what, for you to do what God has called you to do, there's going to be a knowledge gap. And some of us are hiding behind the, I don't know, I don't know, how, here let me get you, I don't know how to be a mom. I don't know how to be a dad. I didn't have a good fa father. I don't, or something I hear, I don't know how to pray. Pastor, I don't know how to pray. I, I don't know how to read my Bible. Hold on. Is it in English? Do you have an English Bible? Amen. I can't stand, I can't stand, I don't know how to read, are you kidding me? Just read, like, so you're hiding behind, you got a gap of knowledge, you do not know the word of God or the will of God, and you're hiding behind this, I don't know how. Pick up that Bible and close the gap. Amen. Somebody say close the gap. Close the gap. All right, number three, here's the third gap, the timing gap, the timing. This one says, well, it's just not the right time. To begin, pastors, it's not the right season. Just not the right, like, like I don't have the time, I don't have the money, I don't have the energy, I don't have the focus. Like I intend to someday to get around to that, but it's just not the right time. People with good intentions make promises, but check this out, people with good character keep them. Okay, I wonder what the world would look like if everybody just did what they intended to do. Oh my gosh, we would have a different world, a better place if we all just did what we intended to do. The reality is you will never get much done in your life until or unless you just go ahead and do it before you're ready. Just do it before you're ready. I don't know how ready Nehemiah was when he went before the king and the king questioned him, but it, never, it's not, it wasn't about Nehemiah's convenience or his readiness. Listen, you don't rebuild when you're ready, you rebuild because it's right. It's the right thing to do. It's what God, it's what God wants me to do. That's why I'm ready. Not because I'm ready, it's because God, it's right. I gotta close the gap. At Discovery, we have a saying to help us with this whole timing thing and waiting for the right time. I tell my leaders and pastors this. It's a saying, it's, it's, it's ready, Shoot, aim. Doesn't make sense, does it? Because <laughs> you usually say, hey, ready, aim, fire. What I found out is most of you get stuck on aim and never fire. So I just, I just twist, like, ready, shoot already, dang it, and then, and then aim. <laughs> okay, so, 
I, I'm just, I'm trying to help you all out today to close some gaps. And some of you have a gap of this timing thing. Like you're waiting for the right time. And the best time for you to start is right now. Say close the gap. Close the, gap. the fourth gap is the mistake gap. We're getting through them. We're getting through them. The mistake gap says, I'm afraid of making mistakes. See, some of you are running from your assignment because you're afraid of messing it up. Or or you're afraid of messing up again. So it's preventing you from rebuilding because you have a fear of messing it up or messing it up again. And if you want to leave a legacy, you got to get over your fear of making mistakes. Say, close the gap. Number five, number five, the perfection gap. This one's very similar to the timing gap. The perfection gap says, I have to find the best way before I start. (laughs) So listen to me. Oftentimes, you got to get started before you can find the best way. That's very, very often we, our hesitation to get started while we're trying to figure out the ins and outs and what do I do over there? And then what if this happens and that happens? Sometimes you just got to get started to even figure out what the best possible way is. It's, it's like driving down an unfamiliar road when it's dark and you, you don't know where like you're going. You'd like to be able to see your whole route before you begin, but that's not the way it works. It, it's revealed progressively. It's revealed as you move forward a little bit more as the road is revealed to you. So listen, if you want to see more of the way, then get moving. You get like just if you want to see, oh, what happens in what just get moving and, and then you'll figure out what to do at that fork. But don't let that stop you from rebuilding. There is a gap that some of you have called perfection. And it's preventing you from closing. It's preventing you from building. Say, close the gap. Number six, number six, the inspiration gap. Some of these I have little patience for, and I'm trying not to be a jerk. I don't feel like doing it. I don't feel like it. Um, I don't have the, the, the time, money, experience, so on. It's easier to leave it alone, right? Nehemiah said, we studied, I think, last week, that Nehemiah said that the people, they finished rebuilding the wall because they worked at it with all their heart. And I hope that you're surrounding yourself with with the right people, the people that are bringing out the greatness that lives inside of you, the potential that's inside of you, that's pulling out that exceeding abundant plan that God has, that exceed, like that surpassing your imagination, dreams, ask, desires, and hopes. I hope you're surrounding yourself with the people who are challenging your potential and who God has called you to be. You know, that's why, that's why you should come to church every week, okay? That's why you should, you should be in a group. That's, you need to be in a, in, a, in a biblical community. You need to be around God's people, around God's word, around God's presence, so you can get the inspiration to do what God has called you to do i don't feel like doing it well who are you around who's feeding that man you need to get around the right people to to and i love like like, that's kind of one of the reasons i believe you come to church i like that i want to fan the flame in you man i want you i want to i want to spark that inside of you that's why you need to be around god's people god's word god's presence say close the gap number seven number seven is the comparison gap this is this is a gap that some of you have. It's why it's, it's just in the wall, man. Uh, the comparison gap says others are better than I am. So some of you don't hang around great people or great things because it challenges your mediocrity. Or, or it challenges your fragile ego. So, so you get stuck comparing yourself to others rather than challenging yourself with others. And, and, and others, are better, others are better than I am. Great. Go learn something. I don't know what your perspective is and why you're comparing. That's fantastic that you know somebody and somebody around you is actually better than you. Wow. Amazing. Go learn something. Change your perspective. That is toxic. Your comparison trap. Nehemiah had all the families in Jerusalem build the walls closest to their home, almost to say like, hey, let them build their wall. They're going to build their wall. Don't look over there. Don't look over there. You focus on your home, okay? You focus on your family. Focus on your wall and close the comparison trap. Say, close the gap. gap. Number eight is the expectation gap. Says, I thought it would be easier than this. Oh my goodness. 
I thought it would be easier. If leaving a legacy was easy, I told you, everybody would be doing it. Everybody would be doing it. Re rebuilding isn't easy. Rebuilding your marriage after the damage of a pandemic isn't easy. Rebuilding your children after stay at home, no school isn't easy. Rebuilding the walls of God's kingdom are not easy. I don't know what your expectation is, but we set out to see breakthrough happen in 52 days as we dedicate ourselves to rebuilding what the enemy has damaged or destroyed. But can I tell you something? You cannot change your destination overnight, but you can change your direction overnight. So, hey, 52 days are going to come. I'm telling you, I'm believing for breakthrough, but, but your destination necessarily won't change. But what I'm hoping to change is your heart posture, your focus, your energy, your direction is going to change. In Jesus' name, say, close the gap. We made it. Here's number nine. We made it, y'all. Okay, here's number nine. This is, this is what I really want to talk about today. All that was just... I don't know. I went gap crazy. Okay. Here's the inconsistency gap is, is, is the space between what you believe and how you behave. I believe that this is the largest gap in your legacy and you doing what God has called you to do and being who God has called you to be like, like your marriage, your family, your kids, your calling, your identity, your like you're, you're making a difference. This right here is the biggest gap that we need to address, it is often the one that we leave unaddressed, the inconsistency of our outer life with our inner life, our actions with what we believe and want. Because I want to be healthy and fit, but I want to eat donuts and double cheeseburgers <laughs> with some avocado and ranch on that thing. Come on, the struggle is real. Somebody help me. Okay? So, so the outer and the, and the inner, because listen, I want the, I want the benefits of, of the peace that comes with a pure mind, but I want to continue to dabble in porn. There's an inconsistency with what I desire internally and what I'm engaged in externally. I want the, the benefits of a godly marriage. I want a respectful wife, but I want to live selfishly. There's an inconsistency in what you desire, like inwardly, and your actions outwardly. I want the benefit of kids that the, hey, man, I make a decision. What's wrong with these kids? But I'm going to continue to model the wrong decisions. There's an inconsistency. There's a gap that just, that needs to be closed. See, giving up something, listen, giving up something now for something better later is not a sacrifice. Man of God, woman of God, that's an investment. See, because that's why the gap exists, because there's always a sacrifice to close the gap. There's always a laying something down. There's always a dying of your flesh or your selfishness or something to close that gap. So in Nehemiah chapter 5, um, there's an inconsistency gap. This is the biggest challenge, the biggest gap that Nehemiah, this is the biggest leadership test that Nehemiah would have to face in rebuilding the walls of the kingdom of Jerusalem. It was not the enemy outwardly. It was not Sambalot and Tobias and the opposition that were coming against them. The biggest challenge came from within the camp. There was inconsistency in the camp. There was See, see, in Nehemiah chapter 5, we're going to read it, but let me kind of set it up for you. They, they were rebuilding, the, the rich, noble Jews were actually exploiting the workers of the wall, taking advantage of them. They, so while they're rebuilding the walls of the kingdom of Jerusalem, the, the rich, noble Jews were taking advantage and exploiting God's people while trying to build God's kingdom. There was an inconsistency that Nehemiah saw, and this would be his biggest test because these were the individuals who were bankrolling the building project. These were the rich nobles that, hey, though, everything's on the line here, man. What do I do here with this inconsistency in my home, in my camp? Do I address this thing? Because if I do, the whole project could fail. If I do, these guys are the ones who are sending workers to the wall, part of their home, part of their house. If I address this inconsistency of character and conduct, man, everything's on the line right here. And this was his biggest test. Could he close the inconsistency gap or would he continue to turn a blind eye? Nehemiah 
chapter 5, verse 1 through 5, says this. It says, now the men and their wives raised a great outcry against their who? Their fellow Jews. This is their brothers and their sisters. So now they're not complaining about the enemy who's, who's uh, threatening to attack or coming against or causing division. This is my brother, <laughs> my sister, my dad, my this is like, is it my own home? Is it my camp that something is wrong here? Some were saying we and our sons and daughters are numerous. In order for us to eat and stay alive, we must get grain. Now, here's what was happening. They were working so hard on the wall, rebuilding the wall, that they really did not have the time to dedicate to the harvest. As much time as was needed, at least, to feed the entire people in the camp. So there was, there was a lacking there of, of harvest. And so... What the rich nobles did is they took advantage of that. Others were saying, we're mortgaging our fields, our vineyards, and our homes to get grain during the famine. So they're taking a, they're taking a second loan out. They're taking a loan on the home and a third loan on the home. Just kind of stay alive while they're rebuilding, building and battling and loaning. Look what it says. Still others were saying, we have had to borrow money to pay the king's tax on our fields and vineyards. Although we are the same flesh and blood, man, this is our family. Though their children are as good as the, our children are as good as theirs, look, yet we have to subject our sons and daughters to slavery. Some, he says, of our daughters have already been enslaved, but we are powerless because our fields and our vineyards, they don't even belong to us anymore. So they're complaining about each other because these rich noble Jews were exploiting the poor Jews in a time of crisis. They were taking advantage and capitalizing on their misfortunes. They, they, th those who had money and food were saying this. This is what, essentially what they were saying. You sell me your house and I'll give you some food. Oh, you need some money? I'll loan you some money, but I'll, at a high interest rate, 24%, capital one. No, I'm just kidding. Uh, you know what I mean? Uh, uh, and then if you don't pay it, that's okay. Give me your daughter, your brother. This is your brother. This is your family. This is your fellow Jew. Give me your daughter. I'll sell them into slavery and, 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 and that'll, that'll, that'll pay the debt that you owe me. This was, Nehemiah sees the inconsistency and, and he's like, he doesn't turn a blind eye to it. This is, this is in violation, not just to like human code. This is the law and the will of God. It's not in your notes, I don't think, but Deuteronomy chapter 23 specifically forbade this kind of conduct among the Jewish people. This is what God said. It's actually in Exodus and in Deuteronomy and in Levitic Leviticus and Deuteronomy. It says, do not charge a fellow Israelite interest, whether on money or food or anything else that may earn interest. So when you're going to loan to your brother or sister, God said, no, 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 you're not going to when you're not going to take advantage of their need. If you can help them, you help them. Look what he said. He says, you may charge a foreigner interest. You can do that for them, but you can't do it for your family. You can't do it. No, no, no. But, but not a fellow Israelite, so that the Lord your God may bless you. This is, this is a command attached to it now. You want the blessing of God on your home, yet you're allowing inconsistency to live in your camp, in your heart, in your character, in your conduct, yet you want the blessing of God. And here he says, no, 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 here's, if you do, you get the blessing, he wants to bless you in everything you put your hand to in the land that you are entering to possess. So the Bible also says that Jews in a different spot, not, that the Jews, they, they cannot enslave one another. It's against the, like, against the law to do that. If somebody was poor, they could work for you, but you cannot, you cannot put them into, into slavery. They're in direct violation of the will of God. And here's why this is so important, this inconsistency gap, you guys, because there's some gaps that you can address over here, but this one, between what you believe and how you behave, Jesus said in Mark chapter 8, 25, if your house is divided against itself, it will fall. If you have this inconsistency, this division in what you believe and what you desire and how you behave and the, your, your actions, you are going to destroy your children. You are, gonna, you are going to destroy your legacy. You don't have a legacy if this gap does not get closed, this inconsistency gap. So what do we do with it, man? We, we got to close the gap. Say close the gap. There's this law that works against you, though. It's in your notes. The law of diminishing 
intent is what it's called. The law of diminishing intent it says this. The longer you wait to do something you should do now, the greater the odds that you will never actually do it. The law of diminishing intent. The longer you live with that gap, the more comfortable you get with it there. The longer you live with that secret sin, that, that gap that you're allowing, you know what God wants you to do and yet you're not doing it. The longer you, you continue to, to have that, that character, that, that whatever, as long, the, the harder it is to close the gap. So, so what do you do? You should do something. Just do something. So what did Nehemiah do? He, four things I'm going to show you. What, what Nehemiah did. How did he handle the inconsistency in his own camp? Number one. First, he got to get angry with inconsistency. That's weird, huh? Get angry with inconsistency. That's what he did, though. In, in verse 6, in verse 6, it says this. When I heard the outcry from my brothers and sisters of these charges, I was very angry that the Hebrew there is vehemently hot. Like, he is, he is ticked off, man. This is, we see this a few times in Nehemiah. Like, he's just... He's not afraid to like express his emotion and get hot. Nehemiah did not ignore the problem. Check it out. He took it seriously. Like he took the inconsistently. And if you're a leader of any kind of group and, and the harmony of your people is threatened, you better get angry. If you're a leader of your family, if you're a leader of a team, if you're a leader of a group, if you're any kind of leader and that harmony is threatened and there's inconsistency, then you better get angry. Like you got to, and, and you know what? You are commanded. You know you're commanded to get angry. Ephesians chapter 4 says, be angry. And don't sin. Some of you are like, yes, finally. <laughs> Comma, <laughs> but don't sin. How many know you can be angry and not sin? Do you know that? You can be angry and not sin. Because if, if anger itself was a sin, then God is a sinner. Right? Because he got angry. Jesus got angry. Okay. And so, so there is an anger and, and not sin, okay? It's, it's very possible. One of the first things you need to do, though, if there is an inconsistency in your life, if there is this gap in your life, in your home, in your faith, in your character, instead of hiding from it, instead of acting like it doesn't exist, instead of ignoring it, is to get angry at the sin in your life, at the inconsistency in your life, to look at it straight on and say, man, I am tired of this gap in the wall. Okay, there's, and then number two, very important, number two, get out of here. You see that thing attacking me? Think before you react. Think, think about it, think about it. That's what, I love this, verse number seven. It says, so after, Nehemiah, so after thinking about it, <laughs> I spoke out against these rich government officials. The Hebrew word for that, th after thinking about, it literally is, I consulted with myself. That's what he said. <clears throat> I consulted. Nehemiah's first reaction was to get angry, but before he did anything, he had to talk to himself. He got alone with God. He prayed about it. He got the right perspective about it. He planned it out. He said, God, what do you want me to do here, God? What do you want me to say? He talked to himself. There are some times when you need to talk to yourself. Like you don't need to talk to anybody else. You need to talk to yourself first. You know why? Because when you're angry, the first response is often the wrong response. Yeah, get angry. That's all right. Get angry. But, you, but you, what you need to do is talk to yourself and pray. Like in that time of reflection and to, to, to think before you speak, James chapter 1, verse 19 and 20. We've studied this in our James series recently. Be quick to listen, slow to speak, slow to become angry. Look at this. For man's anger, that's the key. Man's anger does not bring about the righteousness, the righteous life God desires. Now, if you're confused because you're like, wait, pastor, you told me to get angry. Now, hold on. It, there's, there's a difference between man's anger and God's anger. Man's anger is vengeful, spiteful. Like, I want to get even, I want to get back, I want to retaliate. Okay, that's man's anger. God's anger is not retaliation, it's righteousness. 
It's a righteous anger. So this is why, uh, and you're, hum- you're human, okay? You're going you're gonna to have a little bit of that man's anger, woman's anger inside of you, and you need to do some talking to. You need to talk to yourself. You need to talk to God so you can get rid of that whole, like, I want to be right. I want to uh, uh, get even. I want to I get revenge. And, and, and make sure that you're responding in righteousness, that you're responding with a righteous anger. I'm not trying to get It's not about me. It's not about he, Nehemiah was not angry because of something they did to him and they hurt his feelings and they dishonored him and disrespected him. And I, No, that wasn't it. He was angry because of, the, because of the inconsistency in honoring God. Hey, guys, what are we, what are we doing here? So you got to think, be quick to listen, slow to speak, because impulsive anger always gets you in trouble. Always. Okay? Okay, so get angry, but think before you react. And then number three, here's what he did. You deal with it, and then the key word is specifically. Like, deal with this inconsistency, and I've just been praying for you that the Holy Spirit is revealing inconsistency. Just whatever that is, whatever that gap is in your life that's existing, that you're hiding or ignoring, you got to deal with that specifically. Here's here's why it's got to be specifically, because oftentimes what we try to do is is we're more comfortable working on a different part of the wall than where that inconsistency gap exists. So we'll, we'll spend more time on the wall of our career because I'm successful there. So let me just go over here where I'm making, because I'm a good provider. I provide for my family. Let me just work on that part of the wall. Turn around and look at the gap, bro. Look where the enemy's coming in over here. Yeah, that's just quit acting like it doesn't exist. You got to deal with it specifically. Where is the gap? That's what Nehemiah did. Look at Nehemiah. You are charging your own people. He just, he, speci- he didn't just blanket it. No, you're charging your own. This is exactly what God told us not to do. Here's what you're doing. You're charging people interest. So I called everyone together and I said, look what he said. As far as possible, we bought back our fellow Jews who were sold to the Gentiles. Now you're selling your own people only for them to be sold back to us. Here's what he's saying. Nehemiah, out of his own treasury and some others, were buying the Jewish slaves from Gentiles. Like all, since the exile, since they were returning from the exile, they were actively trying to purchase Jews who were in slavery back. And he's telling them, you guys, we're spending our own money to buy our Jewish People, our brothers and sisters, out of slavery only for you to sell them back into slavery so we can, you, there's a, this is inconsistent, guys. This is inconsistent in, in our camp, in our house. Like, you're trying to rebuild the wall, but you're undermining the effort. You're being inconsistent with how you're honoring God. So where is the inconsistency gap? Where is your gap? Is it in the way you're spending your time? Is it, is it in the way you're spending your money? Do you want Jesus to be Lord of all, but he ain't even... Do you, do you not honor him with the tithe, and yet you say he's Lord of all? Are you, where's the, incon- is there a hidden sin that you haven't surrendered to God? You haven't opened up, shared with anyone? Where is the inconsistency? See, sometimes instead of dealing with the gap, again, you just reinforce a different area of the wall instead of dealing with it specifically we can we'll compartmentalize our life and be okay with being a successful person in this phase only to neglect the failure in this phase and this is this is the biggest the biggest challenge in your legacy is closing the inconsistency gap and it really what it boils down to is this last one, number four. Nehemiah, he was an example of integrity. See, consistency of your outer life and inner life, literally what that is, is an integrity issue. It's integrity. People, men and women of integrity, have their outer life and inner life aligned. When it's not, when there is something outwardly different than what I believe or think inwardly, that is literally the definition of, in, of, of integrity. You lack integrity. I was thinking about this integrity. We're in a building, building phase. We're building our kids' center. And we've been like in a constant, obviously. We constantly build here at, at Discovery because we're constantly reaching people, knocking down walls and building walls. But I was thinking about this idea of integrity, and I started studying 
structural integrity. I had to look at that um, in all of our building phases. Check this out. Structural integrity is the ability of a structure to withstand its intended load without failing due to fracture or fatigue. Listen, this is what integrity does for you, man of God, woman of God. It gives you the the ability to withstand the load that God has put on you, the, the calling he's put on you, the destiny he's put on you, the mantle he's put on you, whether that's mother or father or pastor or leader or supervisor or brother or whatever that mantle is, integrity is what allows you to carry the load without failure, without fatigue. But when the load-bearing structure fails, the load is transferred to potentially and, and to and potentially overloads surrounding support structures. You ever heard of a load-bearing wall? You, you, like a load-bearing wall is a specific wall in the house, in the home, that is built different. It's built to carry the weight, but. But if that load-bearing wall fails, if it lacks integrity, structural integrity, bends, fails, breaks, buckles under the load and under the pressure, immediately what it was supposed to support gets transferred to the other walls, to the other supporting structures that were not intended to carry the weight, to carry the load. See, the load is always transferred. The load is always transferred to one person. That's a slide. The load is always transferred to another. Always, always. It's transferred. So, so when you, listen, when you lack integrity, when you have an inconsistency gap, what you are literally doing is transferring the load to the people you love the most. There will always, there will always be collateral damage when the load-bearing structure buckles. When structural integrity fails, there will be collateral damage. I don't know if you've ever seen those shows or something when they, when they explode the tower or the building and just, up, there's collateral damage when you just, all they do is, when they do that, they just hit the load-bearing structures. They don't care about the other walls. You don't dynamite the other walls. All you do is you go after the load-bearing structure and immediately the load is transferred kids aren't meant to carry that. Your, your wife, man of God, ain't meant to carry that. You know, you're... So what do we do that, that with this inconsistency gap? We, we be an example of integrity. How do we know Nehemiah was a man of integrity? All throughout the story we see it, but, but a couple ways. In, in Nehemiah chapter 7, one of the ways you know you're a man of integrity or a woman of integrity is who you surround yourself with. If the people closest to you lack character, then you lack character too, most likely. If, if, the, if the people closest to you are cheaters, then chances are, if you're not already, you're going to be soon. Okay, so Nehemiah, in Nehemiah chapter 7, this is after the re rebuilding of the wall. I think I read this, you guys, last week. Check, check this out. I put in charge of Jerusalem my brother Hanani along with Hananiah, the commander of the citadel, because I got along with him. Because we clicked. We have the same personality. We like the same team. Okay. No, Nehemiah, Nehemiah was like, no, the people that I'm putting close to me, the people that I'm promoting, by the way, if you're a leader, if you're like a supervisor, manager, if you are, like you can really tell easily in management, leadership, kind of executive, the people that you hire and promote, if they lack integrity, you for sure need to check your heart. Because you will surround yourself with people who are like you. And you don't like to be challenged by integrity if you lack it. So Nehemiah, he says, no, no, I, 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 like I know, I need, the people around, I protect my circle very, 
Like the people, I love everybody, and I like to spend time and connect and love everybody. But the people in my inner circle, they're going to be men of integrity who fear God more than most people do. This is, just, this is a way you can see, like, am I? Are they? Who, like, do we have integrity? Nehemiah, back to Nehemiah chapter 5. Here's what it says. Ne- they, they listen to Nehemiah. You go read it. They listen to him. They, they repent, and they give back all the money, and they stop charging interest, and they, they come and contribute to the work, and they say, you know what? This is inconsistent with what God has called us to be and do. Okay, forgive us. And then, and then Nehemiah sets an example. He says, look, the earlier governors before me, those preceding me, they placed a heavy burden on the people, and they took 40 shekels of silver from them in addition to the food and wine and the allotments. And then he says this, even the assistants, their assistants lorded it over the people. But out of reverence for God, I did not act like that. Instead, I devoted myself to the work on this wall, to the work of rebuilding God's kingdom. All my men were assembled there for the work alongside your brothers and sisters like they were working alongside you. So when it comes down to it, the reason why there's an inconsistency gap is this. We never really devote ourselves to what we claim to desire. Never really set an example of integrity and devote ourselves outwardly to what we desire internally. This is the biggest gap that we have to address. Before we move on, before we celebrate in the weeks to come, the rebuilding and how to finish and determination, you've got to close the inconsistency gap. Can I pray for you? Every head bowed, every eye closed. I believe the Holy Spirit has been ministering to you every eye closed in this place. Do me a favor, no stirring just yet. And if you're here and you know God is speaking to you that there's just been revelation given to you. Just a, just a light maybe is how I can explain it. A light shined in some areas that, that you were ignoring. And some of you even forgot they were there. You've been ignoring them for so long and, and maybe working on other parts of your life so you can feel good. All the while, there's a hole. There's a gap in your character, in your faith, in your home, in your marriage. And there's a secret sin that you just are allowing in your life. There's an inconsistency gap. And today, God, help us. Not by might nor by power, but by your spirit, God. Today, we're closing the gap. I'm no longer going to allow these gaps to exist. I'm going to do the work. I'm going to rebuild. It's not going to be easy. It's not going to be automatic. But today, God, I'm starting. I'm not waiting anymore. I'm not waiting for the perfect time. I'm not waiting for all the information. Today, God, I'm addressing it. Specifically, today, God, I'm addressing it. I'm naming it. And I'm going to deal with it. No longer is this gap going to exist in my legacy, in my family, from generate up changing my legacy, my family, and my children, in Jesus' name. With every head bowed and eye closed, with every head bowed and eye closed. If you're here today and maybe you've never prayed something like that or even heard of something like that, the beginning of this whole legacy thing and rebuilding is, 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 through, is through a surrender. You know, this, this about face lifestyle. The, in the Bible, the word repent like uh, when Nehemiah addressed it and everyone the Bible says they repented that's not like a bad word that just means they turned around so you can't change your destination you can change overnight but you can't change your direction and tonight Jesus wants just to change your direction you were going one way but you decided to go another way that's what repentance is I was living for me now I'm going to lay it down and start living for Jesus and some of you have never made that decision today but I want to help you today right now with every head bowed and eye closed, to make that decision. For, or maybe it's for the very first time. For others of you, it's, you need to do it again. I'd love to help you. I'm not going to have you come up to the front or single you out, but right there is your seat. I'm going to count to three. I just want you to lift up your hand. If you're ready for a fresh start, if you're ready to rebuild and let God start in you, like to rebuild you, your heart, your spirit, give you new life today. Come on, on the count of three, lift your hand. One, two, three, lift that up. I need a fresh start today. I surrender. I surrender. All over this place, lift it up high. God, rebuild me before I try to even put my hand to fixing my marriage, fixing my life, fixing my sins, fixing my mistakes. Jesus, only you can fix me. I surrender. I surrender. 
all over this place, all over this place. Thank you, Jesus. Go ahead and put your hands down. The Bible says if you confess with your mouth that Jesus is Lord and believe in your heart that God raised him from the dead, then you shall be saved. So let me help you with a prayer of confession right there. You can whisper it, something like this. Say, Jesus, forgive me of my sins, my past and my mistakes. Today, I declare I'm not in control anymore. You are. You are my Lord, meaning you are in control. You're the master. Come live inside of me, Jesus, and change me. Rebuild me, my character, my heart, my faith. Make me to a brand new person today. Help me to live for you from this day forward. In Jesus' name. And all God's people said, amen.